Hey guys, this is Ian with Team Legit, and today I'm going to demonstrate for you assembling one of the Team Legit Advanced Carbon Control Rod Kits. So, first of all, just in case you haven't picked out a kit yet, let's quickly go over the difference between the three kits we offer. So, all of these kits are meant to be a durability and precision upgrade from what you might already be using or an addition to uh, build your planning. Durability is pretty self-explanatory. These are extremely tough, and when it comes to either hangar rash or rough landings or maybe a little air-to-air -air collision, uh, these guys will hold up very well. Precision, on the other hand, refers to slop, or the lack thereof, in your total control set. So the holy grail of model aircraft, as well as a number of other machines in the world, is to have your input, in this case a servo, have its motion be directly and exactly translated to the control surface. And sometimes that can be easier said than done. What these kits do is attempt to minimize or eliminate any bending or looseness or play, usually we call that slop, in between the servo and the control surface. So that when you're flying, what your thumb does, assuming your servo is up to the task, is exactly what the aircraft does. We presently offer these kits in three different versions. We refer to them by size, small, medium, large, but what that actually refers to is the strength or durability rating that we've given each of these kits. As far as the actual length of control rod, we give you a generous portion in every kit, and for most models, any three of these kits would physically connect and operate the aircraft. The choice comes down to what's going to be most appropriate or what's going to perform best. I'll use the Drax as an example of an aircraft because it's an airframe that a lot of us are familiar with. Small would be for the Nano Drac, medium would be for the Mini Drac, and large would be for the original 60 inch Drac. You can use the medium kit on the Nano Drac. There's no rules, do whatever you want. Just understand that there's uh, pros and cons to doing such. On our web pages for the three kits, you'll find charts that uh, show what we recommend for usage based on things like style of aircraft and servo size. So check that out if you're still trying to decide. With that out of the way, let's build. So my project for the day is to renovate and give a little TLC to this uh, Hardcore 38 from Right Wing. I built this uh, many years ago. In fact, the last time it flew was in 2017 when uh, it crashed at the Phoenix Cup wing race and it has not flown since. So part of this renovation process is I'm going to replace the control rods that I had on there back when I first built it. And the uh, horns have kind of loosened on the uh, surfaces, so it could just use a new set. Let's get to it. All right, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the components, make sure everything's here, and we're going to make some choices about which, which components in the kit we're actually going to use. All right. This is the business end of things, our carbon rods. Those are four millimeters in the medium kit we've chosen here. Uh, instruction sheet, which is basically me talking to you now. All right, and we've got our three baggies. Um, so this is the bag of couplers and clevises. We've got our small fasteners. Now be careful guys that when you do this, things don't go flying like they do for me. And then we've got our control horns. Okay. Now this is the medium kit. With the large kit, aside from all these components being scaled up a little bit, you're actually going to get aluminum ball links, which are very cool. Uh, so these guys are aluminum sheathing with a brass insert and then a steel um, center tube. I don't know what you want to call that, uh, but those guys are very trick. On the small kit, everything's going to be a little smaller. These are going to be plastic instead of aluminum. Uh, you're not going to get ball links on the small kit, um, but instead of these horns, which are adjustable, you're going to get these guys, which are a choice between two long horns and two shorter horns. So uh, all four of these are going to be included in the kit. You're just going to make a decision about whether you want tall horns or short horns. That might depend on how long your servo arm is uh, or just what kind of geometry you want. 
safe bet is always to go with a one-to-one -one ratio of servo arm length to uh, control horn length. With the medium and large kits, you're going to decide whether to apply a clevis or a ball link to the servo. The control horn at the rear is always going to get a clevis. Ball links tend to be a superior style in concept, um, just in that they spread their load over a much larger area and are less prone to developing looseness with wear. But the downside to ball links is that when they exert a force back on the arm, they do so off-center, whereas a clevis applies its force directly down the center of the arm. So the reason why we give you both is because if your servo arm is thin and floppy, you're going to want to use a clevis. If it's stiff and rigid in a torsional manner, you're going to get to use a ball link. A shortcut is if you have a nylon arm, we recommend a clevis. If you have an aluminum arm, we recommend a ball link. If you've got a thick, beefy nylon arm that uh, is super stiff, use a ball link, see how it works for you. But just keep an eye out for that arm twisting in the vertical axis and robbing you some of that precision. For this project, I'm using great servos that came with wimpy arms, so I'm going to be using the clevis. All right, guys, to get to the control rods, you're going to want to get your aircraft to about this state, meaning uh, lamination done if you're going to laminate it and the control surfaces attached. You're going to want the servos in, although it's okay to dry fit them if you're not ready to glue them in yet. On this repair, I've gone ahead and removed the center fins because that's going to give me easier access to work on the servo linkages. Let's mount this horn. So what I like to do is take a ruler and come straight back from the pivot point between the servo arm and our control rod. I just like to make a pen mark as a reference point. Now remember, if you're using a ball, the ball is gonna be offset by a few millimeters. So if you want your linkages to look perfect, make sure to offset where your horn is to match up with how much the ball is offset. If you're using the clevis, you just want to go exactly straight back from where that pivot point is. Now that we've marked where the center of our horn is going to be, let's mark where the actual holes are going to go for the horn to attach onto. So I'm just lining up the post with the mark that I made previously. And now we're going to need some way to transfer these three dots onto the control horn. So what I like to do is I use a thin poker of some kind to just make an indentation in the actual balsa wood and that's a good reference for me you can also you can use a pen if you have one thin enough but now i've got one two three uh, just press marks on the balsa that we're going to hit with a drill so you don't have to use a drill you can use something less serious than that but uh I like to do it this way. So I just carefully line things up and it just goes through like a knife through butter. I'm gonna grab one of our back plates and three of our long screws. This can be a little finicky, but patience goes a long way. If you have an electric screwdriver, this uh, can go a lot faster. But now we're going to come around to the other side and line things up with the back plate here. And of course, they never quite, they're never quite perfect. They always need some wiggling to line up correctly. I like to get one caught and then just focus on catching the next one. There we go. Now, uh, one option here is to put a little glue in between uh, the balsa and the um, horn if you want a little extra security, which is what I'm going to do right now. This will make it a little harder to remove later on. I like to pop just a little bit of glue underneath both sides now the real reason I'm doing that is because this 
part of the balsa is already kind of weakened from the uh, horns that were on there previously, since this is a renovation. So this is like doing lug nuts on a tire. You do a little bit on each and then go around the circle. And I like to stop right when the balsa begins to yield and you get like a very slight indentation. That feels pretty good. Next up, we're just gonna put the eyelet on and that's as easy as screwing it down. Now, there are different reasons why you might wanna go higher or lower on the eyelet as it is adjustable up and down. But uh, my general way to do it is to just make this a one-to-one -one ratio between height of the servo arm and height of the eyelet location. It's important to remember that we're not going by the exterior dimensions, but we're going by the actual distance between the hole itself that we're gonna use and the pivot point. So the pivot point on the control surface is the hinge here. And up on the servo here, it's gonna be the distance between not the top of the wing, but the screw of the servo. Now this is easier done when the servo is outside of the aircraft, but I've got about 13 and a half on the front. So I'm just gonna match that on the rear. And this excess shaft, we're gonna cut that off at the end once we know we're happy with everything. Okay, now we're gonna put the clevis on, or the ball, if that's what you're using. So the clevis goes on with uh, one of these pins and a C-clip, but we're not gonna use the C-clip yet because we're not locking it down. What we're broadly gonna do next is mock up the length of the rod so that we can measure how long to cut our carbon tube. So this pin has to fit into that hole. That hole is not gonna be large enough and that's a good thing. We want this pin to fit very tightly. If this pin has movement in any way, it will again be a source of imprecision. So we want this to be a tight fit. The pin itself is not gonna pivot. The clevis is gonna pivot around the pin. So we've got to enlarge in that hole. When enlarging a nylon hole, you wanna be very careful that you don't go too far. Uh, you can use a very small drill bit if you have one, or uh, the old time-honored tradition is to use an X-Acto knife very carefully, just twisting an X-Acto knife to kind of enlarge in the hole, but you wanna make sure you don't go too far. Okay, let's see how that is. So it's actually a little too tight. So I'm not gonna go to a bigger bit. I'm gonna take the same bit and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna work it around a little bit to try to open up the hole. Nice. Snug, but we can take it out with our fingers. We don't need tools. Uh, the clevis is the same on both sides, so it doesn't matter which way it goes. Now that'll sit there just fine without the clip. Uh, we're going to do the clip again after we're happy with how everything sits. So now if we tug on the clevis, we should not feel any slop between the clevis and the horn. As you're going through this assembly process, it's good to stop at each checkpoint and just kind of wiggle things with your fingers so that if there is a source of slop, you can identify where it is, as opposed to getting to the end, things don't feel perfect, and you're trying to figure out why not. Okay, now we're gonna do the exact same thing on the rear. And remember, you don't get a choice in the rear. You have to use a clevis. And the reason is because of the pivoting nature of the eyelet back here, which is great because it allows the horn to move around from side to side if it needs to a ball link will, you'll have two loose joints. And uh, if things are tight, it can actually seem okay on the bench and then you go fly and your surfaces get jammed in a weird position. Use a clevis in the back. The aluminum clevis is rigid enough that it will hold onto that eyelet, won't let it pivot at all. Now you shouldn't need to drill out the eyelet. It should be sized for the pin as is. And just move it around until you find the hole and pop it in. And again, Nice and tight, uh, but we're not going to do the C-clip yet. 
Now's the fun part. We're gonna measure for cutting the carbon tube. So that's gonna involve taking couplers and putting them into each clevis, front and back. And the depth of thread that you're gonna to wanna to do with uh, these couplers, I usually say go two thirds because this is gonna be your fine adjustment once everything is assembled. So if you go two thirds depth, that lets you advance a third to all the way compressed and back off a third to all the way open while still having that last third of threads for the coupler to grab onto. Same thing on the front. We're gonna make sure the servo arm is vertical or wherever we expect neutral to be. We're gonna set the elevon to neutral. We're gonna be measuring from the base of the cone because that base of the cone is where the rod is gonna go up to once it's inserted. It won't be able to go past that. So we're just gonna measure from cone to cone, 59 millimeters on this aircraft. So that's gonna be our cut. Now, if you're brave and greedy, you can take that measurement and just assume that the other side's gonna be the same and cut your rod for both sides. Uh, if you're being cautious, you wanna do the exact same process to the other side and measure that separately. If your control run is short, then you may have excess rod, at which point, sure, cut away, and uh, if you mess up, you can always go back and just cut more. If you have a relatively long control run and you need both tubes, one for each side, then you better get it right the first time. All right, to actually cut the carbon, we're gonna either use a rotary power tool, such as a Dremel, uh, or we can use a small hand saw. The rotary tool is gonna make it a lot easier though. So we're gonna start by cutting a piece of masking tape that's gonna go around the tube at the point where we're gonna cut it. The reason we use masking tape is because it's gonna contain any splinters that might come off the tube as a result of cutting it. And it's gonna make the process of cutting the tube a lot less risky to the integrity of the tube. Now, with the power tool here, we're gonna cut through the center of each piece of tape. Now guys, whenever you're cutting carbon or really dealing with it in, in any way, you wanna be very careful about dust and particles. You don't wanna inhale or ingest that stuff in any way whatsoever. And in fact, I recommend going outside to do this. Because I've done this a million times, I'm just gonna do it here in the shop because I'm very careful and I know how to be careful. But if you're at all concerned that some of this dust might become airborne in your environment, please do this outside. So low speed on the Dremel. And we're just gonna go a little bit at a time. I like to roll the tube around as I do this and I just cut through a little bit at a time. You can go up on the speed a bit if you want, but I don't like to go crazy. And there we go. Now we can see I've made a bunch of dust on the table, which is perfectly fine. We're gonna clean that up as soon as I do the other side. Now remember, you wanna cut down the center of the tape. Now remember guys, after you do anything with carbon, don't lick your fingers. You're gonna to wanna to wash your hands before touching your face, eating food, anything like that. We remove the tape. So now we're gonna take a scrap of sandpaper and use that to make sure both the rods fit into the couplers. We're actually gonna do this anyway to all four rod ends to promote adhesion of the glue that we're gonna use in a minute. So holding the sandpaper still, we're just gonna lightly sand down the end of the tube, spinning, uh, twisting the tube in my hands as I go. And now let's see. Perfect fit. So there's number one. I like to hold it in my hands to rough it up for glue adhesion but then 
use the table to uh, kind of bevel the edge if it has trouble fitting in the couplers. One, two, perfect. Clean up the dust, throw out the sandpaper. Now you can probably use a variety of glues to glue the couplers onto the rods. I've always used epoxy, so that's what I'm gonna do. This is five minute epoxy, which is the quick stuff. All right, I'm gonna mix them up on this cardboard here. Equal parts A and B, and we get a five minute working time with this stuff. Chopstick. Very useful in the hobby world. And using this chopstick, I'm just going to coat the outside of the end of the rod, you know, about half an inch or so, the length of the coupler, and the end with epoxy, and then slide it on. And I'm going to kind of twist it as I go. Okay. And wipe off the excess. And now I'm going to do the same to the other side. The, uh, the air inside the tube will actually tend to uh, push them apart as you apply them. So just make sure that they're fully seated. If the couplers are popping apart on you based on air pressure, you can just take a piece of tape and uh, put them in their place. Cool. Now that the couplers are cured onto the carbon rod, let's mount this up. So we're gonna remove the clevis from the control surface. And we're gonna start mounting it at the front. So we're gonna take our thread locker. This would be the blue removable type, so or a non-permanent thread locker. The reason why we use a little bit of this is actually to reduce the small amount of play that can occur between metal on metal threads. We're gonna take just a dab. We're gonna put, whoa, way too much. We're gonna put a very small amount on the threads of each end. That was way too much. That's also too much. We're gonna backtrack by taking this paper towel and kind of soaking some of it up. Uh, this will make um, it more difficult to make adjustments later on, but I think it's worth it. We are now going to thread the control rod with our cured couplers into the front. And again, you want to leave about a third of the threads showing. Now from this point of view, we can visualize whether our measurements were, uh, were on or not. Pretty good. I'm actually gonna elongate it slightly. So we're gonna back off the front and back off the rear. And I'm actually gonna take a pin. Uh, this is another kind of form of dry fitting. I'm gonna push a pin all the way through and then use that to just line up with the uh, hole in the eyelet so that it stays together and I can kind of see what's happening. So I like that geometry. Remove the pin and insert it for a reel. And remember, this is a little stiff by intention, so you might take pliers and uh, use them to kind of just pop that in if it's giving you a little trouble. That looks pretty good, guys. Uh, all we have left to do is the C-clips and then trim off the excess. So I'm gonna come with my C-clips here. So I like to use a flathead screwdriver to mount these. What I'll do, line it up, and then while kind of holding it in place with my finger, I'll take the tip of the flathead and I'll just kind of apply gentle pressure being careful not to stab myself like I just did. There we go. That pop is what you're looking for. Now I'll do the same on the rear. 
carefully line up the C-clip. Again, I'll put pressure, mild pressure on it with my fingers, and then we're looking for that pop. There we go. Now we clip off the excess bolts. Remember, there's the excess on the top and the excess on the bottom. We get rid of both uh, just so we don't stab ourselves while handling the aircraft. Someday you'll be glad you did. Now you can use heavy clippers or a rotary tool to cut those off. If using a rotary tool, I recommend using a damp paper towel to make sure that things don't heat up. Remember, when this piece comes off, it's gonna be hot. So if you've got foam around, make sure it doesn't fall in the foam. Like mine just did. And then once it's cut off, I like to round the edge to make it make sure it's just not sharp. Perfect. One down, three to go. So this time we have metal shavings instead of carbon dust. You always want to be aware of uh, what you're putting in your space. And there we go, guys. We have a control rod. This is very direct. Uh, whatever movement we get out of the surface is movement in the actual arm of the servo. So we've got a direct connection to the servo itself, which is what we're after. If you have any questions about the assembly of this kit or the usage of this kit, feel free to reach out to us. Or if you want to ask questions of other builders and see what other Team Legit customers are up to, check out the Team Legit Pilots Club discussion group on Facebook. That's it for this video, guys. Thanks for watching.